Thank you for uh, joining me here today. I'll be talking about uh, WebAuthn, uh, talking about its authentication properties, its privacy properties, and its convenience properties. Uh, to introduce myself, uh, my name is Subi Rahman. I'm a software engineer working for Duo Security based out of Michigan in the United States. Uh, Duo did some of the earliest explorations with the WebAuthn API when it was in, uh, you know, sort of alpha level format. And earlier this year, we rolled out our integration with WebAuthn, providing fast authentication to the millions of users who rely on us for secure access to their applications. Uh, a show of hands, um, how many people before today have heard of WebAuthn? All right, so I can, I can leave, you know, all of you are fine. I don't think you need me at all, so. No, I'm going to say. So uh, in this talk, I'll be going over a few topics to generally introduce WebAuthn and then to describe, you know, its general properties that I mentioned. I'll introduce with the general problem of passwords. Uh, many of you who are probably AppSec people are familiar with this problem, but I'll just go over it so we can discuss it in the context of WebAuthn. I'll introduce the WebAuthn API. Uh, I will then go over user and developer convenience with WebAuthn, and then I'll discuss how the various convenience properties meet up with the privacy properties. A little bit about Duo, uh, just so I can explain my work with WebAuthn. One of our core products is providing two-factor authentication. After some type of primary authentication succeeds involving a username and a password, a user is presented with a prompt that looks like this, where they confirm their authentication event with something like a push notification, a phone call, a passcode, or another method. With our integration with WebAuthn, we are able to offer seamless, fast authentication via Touch ID or via YubiKey. Uh, the user, for example, will place their finger on their fingerprint and is able to quickly proceed without needing to pull out a phone for a two-factor event. I'm also the author of this resource here, webauthn.guide. Uh, I wanted to make an effort to help introduce WebAuthn to the developer community. I partnered with a bunch of other folks at Duo to produce this, uh, which is available now. Uh, feel free to check it out. Um, we'll be talking about the WebAuthn API here, but this goes into it with a little more depth. So about passwords. It's almost every day that you hear about a new breach of passwords being leaked onto the internet. I'd imagine it's happened to pretty much everyone here. You've received an email saying you need to urgently change your password because it's floating around the internet. And once your passwords are gone, in many cases, um, that's it. Unless you're one of the relatively uncommon few with two-factor authentication set up, a hacker can proceed to impersonate your identity. There are some big issues associated with passwords that many of us here have encountered. Uh, passwords are a shared secret. They're hard to create and remember. They're easily stolen. They encourage unsafe reuse. And as developers, they're hard to secure. I bring these up because WebAuthn attempts to um, solve these problems in a particular way. The problem of shared secrets. So this is a picture of my cat, and he is going to be the user in this exercise. So let's say that he wants to register on my website. He has to submit a password to me, and I have to persist that password in a database for future use. Um, let's say that a hacker comes along and decides that he wants to hack my cat. The passwords are stored in the database, so he could go looking for it there. If it's not hashed and salted correctly, he can exfiltrate it and uh, use it as he wishes. Uh, but if the password is not submitted over TLS, he could also listen in there to steal it. There's nothing about a password submission that ensures that it's being transmitted securely. Um, yeah, uh, so I wanted to point out another thing really quickly after this proceeds. So, well, let's just skip ahead to this. So on password reuse, uh, these are some of the most common passwords that are commonly used across the internet. I do love that people associate monkeys and Star Wars with passwords. Uh, most people really don't have the energy or desire to generate complex passwords for every website. Uh, this can lead to problems, of course, since passwords can be easily guessed and brute forced in many scenarios. The problem of phishing. Phishing is such a pernicious problem that many organizations have identified it as the primary security threat to their organization. Uh, this is a phishing campaign that I myself crafted using uh, fairly accessible online tools. Um, these campaigns to steal passwords are very easy to set up and very simple to execute. Uh, for example, take this screenshot. Um, unfortunately, you can't read the URL up there, but the URL does not say google.com at all. It says something like portal-login-online.com. 
Its purpose is to steal your Google password. Uh, most people don't recognize that. Most people don't read the URL bar, and that's what makes this attack so effective. You know, a password submission looks like a password submission to most of our users, which makes this attack so effective. According to our data, 31% of users click on phishing links, and 17% of users submit their passwords to phishing sites. This is a very serious problem, and I don't think we should underestimate the gravity of this. Uh, all our users, all of us, are at risk of having our privacy violated in really vicious ways. Activists, for example, are at particular risk of being targeted in sophisticated phishing campaigns by state and non-state actors. Uh, the repercussions of having your personal data stolen as an activist can be really grave. Phishing attacks can alter the shape of history, potentially, like when a Russian hacking group infiltrated the emails of the Hillary Clinton campaign in America in 2016. Uh, I've heard people openly wondering that perhaps we may have a different president if this campaign did not succeed. So on password reuse, um, obviously people here are, uh, you know, they know about this issue. They are less likely to reuse passwords, but out in the real world, people do for some of the reasons I've mentioned. Passwords are hard and annoying to remember. We can only stuff so much into our brains. The typical recommendation is to use a password management tool that can randomly generate and securely store passwords. This is nice, but it's also a another tool that sort of complicates the whole user experience. It's a bit cumbersome. Most users just want to get to their email. Another big piece here is the way developers end up interacting with passwords. Even at companies with very, very smart software engineers and great security teams, all it takes is one bug hiding in a huge software architecture, and the password is potentially gone. And if these organizations can't get password-based authentication right, uh, I want to ask, what hope is there ultimately for the rest of us? So our instinct may be to blame the users here. After all, they're doing so many things wrong. Even the developers are doing things wrong. They're so dumb. Why can't everyone just be smarter? But I think this is the wrong instinct. If these issues keep happening, even to smart people, we shouldn't be trying to blame the victims of password theft. This is a systemic issue, and it requires a systemic solution. Uh, this is a great quote that I really feel helps boil the problem down to that of design. So blaming the users for the usability problems of passwords is not an exercise that will ultimately solve the problem, because the ultimate design of passwords relies on our brains, and our brains are very fallible things. The net result of the design is this. We're at a point where, like this report says, if passwords were sufficiently replaced, 80% of data breach-related attacks would have to adapt or die. To come back to the overall picture of password interaction, a shared secret exists, which the user has, but the relying party also has. The attacker can steal this password from a number of different points. If he successfully gets it, he's able to impersonate the user. However, what if, introduction to public key cryptography here, there were two keys that could be used to identify and authenticate me. One key remains with the user in private, the other can be shared publicly with anyone. So you can send it to the server, it can be persisted in the database, shared openly. What is important here is that the combination of the two keys is what is used to authenticate the user. So there is no shared secret. If the hacker goes and steals the public key, the hacker cannot do anything with it. This is the promise of public key cryptography, and this is the promise of WebAuthn. It allows relying parties, uh, application developers, to authenticate their users using public key cryptography. And it now works and is now available in a browser API that's available or under development in all major browsers. So first, I will go over the security properties of WebAuthn. And just as a general glossary of terms I'm going to use, an authenticator is the hardware that the user interacts with for registering and authenticating. The credential is the term used to refer to the private public key pair that is used for authenticating. The relying party is the entity or organization responsible for registering and authenticating users. If you're an application developer, you are the relying party. At a high level, WebAuthn can be described with a few characteristics. I apologize if you're trying to take pictures. I promise I'll share the slides out later, so don't worry about that. <laughs> I know I'm going fast. It could be described as strong, it can be described as scoped, and it can be described as attested. And I'm going to go through all of these terms in some detail. 
When I say strong, I'm not really referring to the fact that you can use a biometric authenticator, though that is really cool. What I mean is that on many of your devices today, we have or we can add entirely separate computers that are capable of secure cryptographic operations. Uh, these are often called trusted platform modules. In an iOS context, you'll see this referred to as a secure enclave. Uh, this is really cool because a particular weakness of public key cryptography is that the private key can still be stolen. Uh, this separate hardware makes it really a bit more difficult to do so. Scoping. Scoping is an important way to protect and mitigate against many common types of phishing attacks. An important property of WebAuthn is that a credential, the private public key pair, can only be used at a specific origin. For example, OWASP.org. I'll talk more about how the key pair works later, but let's say the user is trying to log into OWASP.org. If he has previously registered a credential with that ID, he can proceed because the credential key pair is associated with a particular origin. So you can think about this like browser cookies. You can only use and read a browser cookie at a particular origin. Web authentication works the same way. Let's say that a hacker has set up a website that impersonates uh, OWASP.org, except the origin is evil-OWASP.org. He sends the user there because he wants to trick the user into giving him data. When the user attempts to authenticate, the authenticator will just reject the authentication outright because the credential wasn't registered at that origin and it's not bound to that particular origin. This helps mitigate against many common types of phishing attacks. Attestation. Attestation is a big topic. Um, it's a complex topic and we're going to be using, we're going to be discussing it later in the privacy conversation we'll have. But at a high level, it's a way to cryptographically prove that a credential key pair came from a particular authenticator. This is the basic flow of how attestation works. During registration, when the key pair is being created, the authenticator provides a certificate that the server can verify. The relying party can use this certificate to determine that yes, the key pair did in fact come from an authenticator we approve of, like something like Windows Hello or Touch ID. If Darth Vader or some less malicious user is intentionally using a faulty authenticator, like a garbage authenticator that barely works, the relying party can make blacklist decisions using this data and to successfully deny the registration event. So now we're going to do an introduction to the API because I feel it will be helpful for explaining the overall security properties of WebAuthn. So registration. This is where the authenticator creates a key pair and gives the relying party the public key. We can take a look at what the flow looks like at a high level. The server requests the authenticator to create a new key pair. This key pair is then produced by the authenticator, a new private public key, and the public key is then sent to the server for storage. The fact, uh, I want to point out here, the fact that an authenticator that is built into your device is responsible for generating keys is actually itself a big step forward. Instead of forcing users to go through the hassle of creating passphrases themselves, the hardware itself is now taking care of that responsibility. Uh, on the front end side, this is the essential API that you will, you will work with as a, develop, as a developer. There's two important functions, one for registration, one for authentication. Uh, to create a new credential key pair, you call navigator.credentials.create with the configuration object I will talk about in a little second. I do want to point out this await keyword, which signifies that this returns a promise. It's an asynchronous operation. All functions with the WebAuthn API are asynchronous. This is for a few important important reasons. Uh, the first one, we cannot register or authenticate a user without explicit user consent, which will be important for the privacy conversations. Consent is something like the user tapping a security key, putting their fingerprint to a fingerprint reader, some type of physical interaction that says, yes, I consent to this event. Another reason is that this allows time for the users to successfully pair a security key they might have with them via Bluetooth or NFC. From a UI perspective, the website will show something like this during registration. The API call will summon an authenticator like Windows Hello to verify the user and to create a credential. After that's finished, the user waits for the relying party to verify this data. And if the server is verified, the user can proceed, they are registered. 
Let's go over, uh, unfortunately, the contrast there isn't too great, but hopefully you can read it. Uh, we can talk about the configuration that um, you can pass into this function. This is more or less the minimal configuration that's required. There's more options, more extensions you can pass in, uh, but this is sort of the minimal part. So at the top there is a challenge. This must be cryptographically random bytes that are generated on the server. It's important to mitigate replay attacks in this context. Uh, the string that's passed in here is verified uh, on the server to confirm that the registration event occurred in the same session. It's not being replayed by a malicious user. RP, if you can see that, uh, it stands for relying party again, uh, which is a term that we've used often so far. Uh, what's especially important here is the ID. Uh, that ID reads duosecurity.com. The ID must be a subset of the origin that's currently in the browser window um, because the credential is bound to this ID. The user information. The credential is also bound to a particular user that's currently registering. So the user ID here is used to bind the credential to the user as well. PubKey cred params. Um, this is a particular, um, it's a particular uh, array which says uh, what is acceptable to the relying party in terms of key pair algorithms. Uh, I'll discuss this a little bit uh, later in terms of the privacy conversation, but you might want to specify that your backend is only capable of parsing certain algorithms. This is where you do so. So, we can go over briefly the data that is retrieved from credential creation, and it's broken down into two parts. The client data JSON, which is data passed from the browser to the authenticator, and the attestation object. Uh, this is data that is generated by the authenticator. It contains the public key uh, as attestation certificate, other useful metadata that can be used by the relying party. This is an example of the client data JSON. You get back the challenge, the origin, and the type of the operation. These need to be carefully verified on the server to ensure the validity of the registration ceremony. Like I mentioned, you have to check the challenge. Um, you have to confirm that the origin matches up to expectations. I'm not going to go through all the verification steps, but there's a bit of legwork that has to be done with WebAuthn and a bit of care. The attestation object. This is a pretty complex object that contains data encoded in a number of different ways. Uh, this is a diagram with lots of boxes and arrows. Um, the object is variable because we can receive attestation data in a number of different formats. For example, touch ID uh, will provide data in a format that's different than a YubiKey. Uh, it also is important because it contains the credential public key, which is in there, uh, which we need on the server to conduct authentications. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's something called an AAGUID, which is going to be important for the privacy conversation. Uh, really quick, we can also go over um, how the public key is encoded. Uh, it's encoded in a format called COS, which is concise uh, object signing and encryption, uh, which basically compresses all of the fields you need in order to like s securely or like concisely store a public key into this format. Um, this might not be terribly meaningful for you, but all of these map to human readable fields, um, like the public key type is EC2, uh, the signature algorithm is EC256, this is the curve type, this is the X coordinate, uh, this is the Y coordinate, all of this information is needed in order to conduct uh, verification operations. So the attestation certificate which is part of the attestation object. Now remember, attestation is a way to cryptographically prove that a public key came from an authenticator. It does things like prove that the key pair came from touch ID and not from a notepad file somewhere. So this is what it looks like if you break out the attestation object in the browser console. Um, you have members like the attestation statement, uh, which contains a SIG member and an X5C member. Uh, the SIG is the signature here that was generated during this registration event. X5C stands for the X509 certificate, uh, which, you know, if you're in application security, you're very familiar with. Um, so at a high level, this is pseudocode for what the attestation process looks like. Unfortunately, again, it's a little difficult to read, um, but on the server, you have the basic ability to use the certificate that the public key did, in fact, come from the authenticator that you expect. You can use the certificate, 
the certificate to make whitelist black list decisions. You can keep the certificate on a revocation list if you want. Uh, it's an important mechanism for relying parties. So after this, you are done with registration. Um, you store the public key on the server because the public key will be used for authentications, which we'll talk about now. Uh, this part will be shorter. I know I went through quite a bit, but authentication is a bit, sim bit simpler. This is where the user proves that they own the private key that they registered with. In other words, they assert that they own the private key. But how do they prove it? The authenticator makes this assertion by creating a signature. Um, this signature is created over the client data JSON that we mentioned before, as well as data that is generated about the authentication event itself. So the signature is generated with the private key, and the signature is then passed to the relying party. The relying party then verifies the signature with the public key that was provided during registration. Again, we have a function call that looks a lot similar to the one that we had before, except we use a function called navigator.credentials.get, which requests an assertion. The experience for our users looks something like this, very similar to what we had before. The API is called, which requests an authenticator to use something like Windows Hello to like read your face and authenticate the user. The user then goes through the authentication flow, and if everything is verified, they are logged in. So let's take a look again at the code needed to make this happen. Uh, I will sort of narrate it because, again, it's a little difficult to read. The challenge is, again, much is the same as before. The challenge is needed to mitigate replay attacks. The RP, uh, the relying party information, again, much the same as before. Allow credentials is a new uh, array of, uh, of objects that is needed here in order to specify uh, the credential that was, get, or sorry, uh, it's where you tell the browser to contact the, authentic the authenticator that was registered before. And you can use the credential ID that was given to use during registration. So you can also specify uh, multiple different authenticators here that are acceptable to the relying party. The server then verifies the assertion. Um, this is all pseudocode because cryptographic signing looks different in every language. But at a high level, you use the bytes from the authenticator data and the client data JSON, and you verify that the signature you received over these bytes, if the verification process succeeds, the user is authenticated, they can proceed into your application. Okay, so that was a lot of code. Uh, we are done looking at code, so... Um, it's going to get a little bit easier now, but uh, we're going to shift the conversation to talk a bit about the user convenience side of things. I've already talked a bit about how users don't have to remember multiple passwords. They don't need to, you know, do various cumbersome things that are required with passwords. All they need to do is tap a YubiKey, put their fingerprint on a fingerprint reader. And the hardware does all the hard work for them. So in the context of primary authentication, WebAuthn goes a long way to answer some of the common issues with passwords. The problem of passwords being a shared secret, in this case, the public key is not secret. Passwords being hard to create and remember, in this case, the authenticator itself is creating the random and secure credential. Passwords being easily stolen, in this case, the secure hardware on devices makes credential theft difficult. Passwords encouraging unsafe reuse, because of the scoping properties of WebAuthn, it makes reuse difficult. Passwords being hard to secure as developers. In this case, again, the credential public key is not secret, and so uh, it potentially eases some of the complexity there. A major perk of WebAuthn is that it'll be able to integrate with uh, authenticators that are now integrated into your devices, like many of you have iPhones or possibly have Surface Books with Windows Hello. Securely generating and storing key pairs used to be not a task that we would typically ask our users to do, but modern advances in hardware uh, make this more and more possible. WebAuthn allows for a lot of really new and interesting user interaction possibilities. This was a demo from last week in Fukuoka, Japan by Fujitsu, where this fellow is really quickly able to wave his hand over a palm reader, uh, which logs him in. So all of the U these UX possibilities are now enabled for authentication via a consistent API, which is really cool. I also think that the accessibility conversation is going to be really important here as well. For our users who are mobility impaired, for example, passwords can be a really pernicious problem. Imagine that you've lost full use of your hands. What are your options? Well, 
I mean, a really bad option is to, you know, speak your password into a voice recognition machine, um, which, you know, at least eavesdropping is not great. Uh, simply imagine older users who have may have some impairments to their memory. You know, remembering passwords can be a really difficult problem. So being able to confirm your identity with a biometric, offloading all that complexity to hardware, uh, opens up a lot of really interesting possibilities. Again, as mentioned, developer convenience is another huge part of this conversation. If you go on the OWASP website, there's a number of guides that detail all the wrong things you can do with passwords. Um, so, but as mentioned, the public key is public. It can be shared openly. Um, that means that a complex salt, salting and hashing system is really not needed in this situation. Uh, this could potentially reduce the complexity and all the maintenance costs of authentication systems. So on privacy, we're going to spend some time talking about the privacy implications of WebAuthn. So just because the FIDO2 ecosystem in general, it's a really broad landscape. It includes browser vendors, web application developers, hardware manufacturers, and more. And each party involved here can't necessarily trust each other. I'm going to go through a few cases that demonstrate how the protocols attempt to deal with this lack of trust. To reframe the challenge here, with passwords, a user's identity is proven with a secret passphrase. But with WebAuthn, a user's identity is proven with a physical interaction with a device. So this may include a biometric interaction, uh, which proves the user is who they say they are. So different care must be taken to ensure that the details about the user's device or about the user's biometrics are not leaked to malicious parties. The first privacy property is this. All WebAuthn interactions require user consent. What this means is that a relying party can request a registration event from a user, but the WebAuthn API will not do anything unless the user actively does something physical. So if the user does nothing, the interaction will just time out. After a certain amount of time, the relying party gets an indeterminate error. Uh, there is an asterisk here, which I will go back to in a second. What this means is that uh, you know, any random website cannot probe a device for the presence of a specific authenticator. So the past few decades have shown, for example, that adware companies will go to any length to track and fingerprint users across the internet, and integrating hardware, um, you know, with uh, the web experience could give them another pathway to do so. But... For example, let's say a, uh, you know, a marketing company wants a way to track uh, a user given that they know that the user has a YubiKey 5C. This is not possible with WebAuthn because, um, you know, uh, the WebAuthn API requires active user consent. The user has to actively tap their key to give up any information. But there's a flip side for this. Let's say that there is a relying party, and the relying party has good intentions. You know, the user has previously registered an authenticator with the website, and they would like to provide a good user experience by discovering if they have their YubiKey inserted so they can automatically initialize some type of authentication event. Uh, we cannot do this because we can only just guess and prompt them and hope that they have their YubiKey with them. So ensuring the easiest possible user experience gets a little bit tricky with WebAuthn. But let's say that I'm a little less picky. And all I want to know is if the authenticator, if they have an authenticator built into their device, like Windows Hello or Touch ID. These built-in authenticators are called platform authenticators, and WebAuthn does allow for the possibility of discovering this information by executing a very precisely named function called is user verifying platform authenticator available. Uh, this allows relying parties some ability to discover if they should actually proceed to prompt users for registering or authenticating with WebAuthn. And all that's returned is a Boolean, so it's not particularly helpful in tracking a user, especially as more devices will have uh, authenticators built in. Another big topic worth discussing is this. Uh, we can expect that there's going to be a huge landscape of authenticators out there, and we can expect that some of them will be problematic. Uh, if you followed some of the news around this, um, you've probably noticed that a lot of things can go wrong. For example, the Titan security keys had an issue where the Bluetooth pairing process could result in an exploitation of the key. Other things can go wrong, like insufficient randomness, uh, private key material being leaked, Security keys have a very complex set of responsibilities and lots of things can go wrong. And it's justified for allowing parties to 
you know, want a way to protect their users and applications against faulty authenticators. So it would be great if there was a way to, uh, you know, whitelist authenticators. Like, I only want to allow Touch ID because I know it's secure. I know that it's not le leaking biometric data to third parties. WebAuthn does give us the basic ability to do this by disclosing a certain amount of identifying information. I talked about attestation earlier. The certificate provided can serve as a way to establish trust in an authenticator. Also, there's an identifier called an AAGUID that is provided alongside that. It stands for Authenticator Attestation Global Identifier. It's intended to provide a way to identify the make and model of an authenticator. Uh, this is called direct attestation when all of this data is correctly provided. But some authenticators will not supply this information. In some cases, you'll just get a self-signed certificate and you'll get 16 null bytes for the AAGUID. This happens when, for example, an authenticator is technically incapable of protecting an attestation private key or for some other reasons that they just didn't want to, you know, provide this information. Uh, in this case, you're not given the, you know, information you really need to establish trust in an authenticator. But there's more. Users also play a role here. When a relying party requests attestation data during registration, a user is prompted to confirm that they are okay with sharing it. If they choose accept, the attestation data will be shared with the relying party. I'll play a video demonstrating that. So I'm going to register. A Touch ID prompt popped up. I put my fingerprint on, and unfortunately you can't see that, but Google Chrome propped up a dialogue asking if it's okay to share information about the security key. And the user has an option to block that or to accept that. When users block sharing attestation, the relying party gets no certificate and they get no AAGUID. In this case, you know, there's very limited ability to verify the integrity and establish trust in an authenticator. This is called non-attestation. There's even more. Uh, I know I'm digging in quite deep into this, but it's a very, attestation ends up being a very complex topic. Relying parties can ask browsers to produce an anonymized certificate. This is intended to strike a balance between the two, to, pr to protect user privacy, while also providing some potentially useful verification data. This is called indirect attestation. And when relying parties request indirect attestation, they get an anonymized certificate, an anonymized AAGUID. The implementation of this is left up to the browser. But uh, the spec actually points out that the relying parties may be out of luck here if they request this. There's no guarantee that you're getting actually useful data. So to sort of sum up here, what can relying parties, normal developers, what can we do? Well, you can reject all authenticators that don't provide a certificate, but this will block users from using authenticators, popular authenticators like Chrome's Touch ID authenticator. Uh, you could also reject all authenticators where users block sharing attestation data. Uh, this may irritate your users who want the highest level of privacy possible. Uh, you can also request the anonymized indirect attestation type, but you'll get potentially unhelpful or indeterminate data. And for what it's worth, at Duo, we do currently mandate that the user attempt to provide us with full attestation data, but we do obviously allow authenticators like Chrome's Touch ID, which doesn't provide an attestation certificate. So a few other properties of WebAuthn. Let's say that you want to whitelist the medium of an authenticator, like you're weirded out by Bluetooth, you only want to allow USB authenticators. Um, the browser might give that to you, but they might not. Um, you can run this function here uh, on the credential object to return an array of the transports associated with that authenticator. Um, it'll be a list of those enums listed on the right, like if it's USB, Bluetooth, a platform authenticator, and so on. However, browsers can deny sharing this information for privacy reasons. Uh, and in this case, uh, the specification notes that relying parties might get upset but you know, there's nothing that can actually be done here. From what I've seen, Chrome actually does return the correct information, so. Uh, lastly, what if you want to whitelist the signing algorithm? Like you only want to allow ECDSA signatures, uh, you don't like RSA for some reason, maybe your backend isn't capable of it, uh, you prefer ES, you, you think ECDSA is more secure, and this is possible. I mentioned the pubkey cred params array here. This is where the relying party specifies the signing algorithms that are acceptable. Uh, 
Negative seven stands for ECDSA. And if the authenticator itself cannot conduct a registration with this algorithm, they are not supposed to proceed with a registration. So another topic which some of you have maybe thought of is lost devices. What happens when a user loses an authenticator? We've all lost phones. We've all broken our phones. What happens in this particular case? So remember, with WebAuthn, a user's identity is now bound to physical hardware. So what happens when a user loses their device or security key? Even simpler, what happens when you want to replace your phone? And I'm just going to show this GIF because I think it's amazing. <laughs> Anyways, um, so for, fallen sto for stolen phones, relying parties do have the option to request that the user verify themselves with something like a biometric indicator. Uh, but users can still use pins and passwords. This helps ensure that the stolen device cannot be used arbitrarily for authentications by the thief, uh, since it adds something that the user knows or something that the user is. But for just lost or replaced devices, this is still a problem. Remember, a new random credential is created for every new applic for every application. So does the user now have to manually revoke and update their credential with every application they've registered with? Uh, the answer right now is kind of yes. Uh, the current FIDO recommendations are as follows. Uh, you know, a relying party can, you know, ask for multiple authenticators, like a backup authenticator, which a user can keep in a drawer at home or something. Or the relying party can run some identity proofing measures. Uh, whatever that means is sort of up to them. I think most people here will understand that this is unfeasible. Uh, the idea of creating a backup credential or going through identity proofing for every application you've registered with is a bit onerous. Uh, some of you probably have encountered this already. If you've enabled 2FA on GitHub or anywhere else, for example, you're provided with backup codes. Uh, you're supposed to securely store those in order to deal with the lost authenticator problem. Um, you know, so one of the plus sides and negative sides are passwords is that they are easily revoked. Uh, this is not true right now uh, with WebAuthn credentials. But there are various proposals for account recovery. There are current discussions ongoing in the FIDO Alliance. One such, or one such proposal is this by Ubico. It's an extension that allows for a backup authenticator to restore private key material that existed on a main authenticator. This is still an early draft. It hasn't been fully reviewed. I just wanted to bring it up as proof that there are proposals to figure out this problem, figure out a practical way to deal with the lost phone or the replaced phone problem. So, to sum up, WebAuthn is a complex series of interactions between authenticators, browsers, users, and applications. All of these parties have some amount of control over authorizing the release of identifying information, and these interactions end up impacting how trust and privacy is established between each party. Privacy is a first-class citizen of the FIDO2 protocols, which is really cool. But, you know, as we say in America, freedom isn't free. It comes with a cost, and the cost of privacy means that establishing trust is impacted in particular ways. So as developers, you have to consider, given the inherent victories and trade-offs of WebAuthn versus passwords, how much trust do, does your application need to establish in users and their authenticators? Some organizations might say that WebAuthn is already, just by itself, such a huge victory over passwords that getting lost in the trust details is not that important. Uh, other organizations may want a tighter level of trust. It's ultimately a judgment call that you and your team will have to decide on. Looking ahead, the level two draft of WebAuthn is currently being written. It'll flesh out details in a number of different areas. I do encourage all of you to take a look. Uh, if you're interested in reading specifications like that. Um, but uh, to sum up, some of the complexity of WebAuthn does come with the fact that it has a lot of really broad industry buy-in with a lot of use cases to account for. You know, we have really willing and vocal support from parties like Microsoft, from Mozilla, from Google. Uh, Apple has started engaging with WebAuthn and will be introducing support in Safari. Uh, major relying parties like GitHub and others are introducing support for WebAuthn, uh, which is really exciting. Obviously, Duo, many other authentication providers as well. 
Uh, on a historical note, the idea of using public key cryptography for authentication has been around for a really long time. Uh, John Udell, a journalist, wrote about this as early as 1997. Uh, he had the idea to use client certificates as an authentication factor. But he later admitted it didn't happen because security products are a royal pain in the ass. So today, secure authentication with public key cryptography is much less a pain in the ass. It's much more possible, and that opens up a lot of really cool possibilities. So again, given the educational challenges here, I made an effort to help introduce WebAuthn to web developers. So if you know web developers who may be interested, feel free to share this with them. There's lots of cool artwork, um, information about the background of WebAuthn, public key crypto. Uh, the end goal is to make this spec, uh, uh, in this entire space, a lot more friendly and approachable. There's code samples uh, for each attribute, how to configure WebAuthn, and the reasoning behind everything. But otherwise, that is it for me. Um, I believe we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, sure. um, and thank you very much for uh, tuning in. If there are any questions, I'm going to bring a microphone. Hi. Uh, so the whole foundation of WebAuthn is based on the cryptographic keys. To the public key and private key, but nowhere in the web authentication specs do they mention about key rotation. What are your thoughts on that? So, by key rotation, do we mean specifically the revocation of key material? Um, so, a web authentication does delegate a lot of responsibility to um, the authenticators itself. I haven't really dug into the CTAP protocol, which deals with the authenticator to browser communication. I don't know if key rotation is specified there. Uh, okay. It's a good point. Um, it's possible that the current the FIDO2 committee is, was meeting in South Korea right now. It's possible they brought it up uh, if key rotation is considered a necessary uh, use case for a particular organization. I'm sure they'd be interested in hearing it. I saw somebody else. Yeah. So, so one more thing is like uh, the usability. So if the private key propagation is not possible because it is getting locked inside a hardware, I have a site where I want to get, um, I want to access it from a laptop, then I want to do it from my mobile. So how do I use the same hardware? Is that how the private key propagation takes place between the devices? The expected use case right now is you would register each device separately with the relying party. Um, the sharing of private key material is not something that is currently like the workflow and or surrounding web then. So for example, with GitHub, uh, like right now you can register SSH, SSH keys, you would register a different key for each device. The idea is that you would register each device separately. Though, um, if you want to have like a roaming authenticator, like a Bluetooth based authenticator, that authenticator can be paired with your phone. It can be paired uh, with your laptop. The idea here is that the roaming authenticator would fill that use case. Maybe one more question as well. So is there any possibility or you have any roadmap for multiple public key, private key pair for a single user? So I can have, uh, these are all my set of public keys. So I can use it for different purpose. So I'm using it from different devices. So I have much more privacy and you exactly don't know which public key is getting used rather than I'm always using a single public key that is giving, or this is the guy is using the single public key. This was the big problem how we have in the privacy. So sure. is there any roadmap there? So I don't want to speak for the FIDO Alliance. Like many of you, I'm more or less a, a consumer of WebAuthn instead of crafting the specification itself. Um, the intended use case right now um, is that private key material is isolated and separate, though it is possible that they may, you know, consider various, you know, key sharing uh, mechanisms uh, in the future. But uh, at least for right now, level one of the draft keeps the keys isolated. Okay, I think we need to wrap up because it's lunchtime, so thanks. All right, thank you very much.